hopefully you all are here because you saw this cool title and you were like, yo, I want to learn how squeezing and stretching the Earth uh, with waves from space. Like, how can we do that, right? Um, that's what this talk is about. And so what you see here is this amazing scientist. Uh, her name is Dr. Katie Mack. She is from uh, North Carolina State University. Um, she's an astrophysicist and cosmologist. And so she's obviously not waves from space. <laughs> she's acting as waves from space for me in this beautiful GIF. And the only reason I have her here is because she made this GIF and I think it's dope and it fits in my talk very well. Um, so you can, uh, we're gonna talk about squeezing and stretching and that's actually representative of the waves from space. So they're coming and forcing her to squeeze and stretch the earth, right? So in order to think about how we can squeeze and stretch uh, waves, uh, sorry, squeeze and stretch the earth with waves, we have to understand what waves are, right? So what are waves, right? We think of them as oscillations in space that carry information or energy. That's a lot of words, but what does that mean? If you have water and you make a water wave, how do you do it? What do you do? To the water. You tap the water, you move the water, right? You create motion in the water. How do you make a sound wave? You create motion in the air molecules, right? And then they bounce off the air molecules in front of them, they push the ones, and they keep going. And what about light? You create motion of electrons. You take an electron and you make it jump from this higher energy state down to a lower energy state, and then a light wave comes out, right? So waves are all about motion, creating some kind of motion, okay? But I was talking about straight up gravitational waves, right? That sounds very made up, very science fiction. And you all can be the judge when you're done here if it is science fiction or fact, okay? I might just be pulling your leg. So if we wanna know what gravitational waves are, I think we first have to understand what gravity is. I forgot that I have a clicker and I can do this like this. <laughs> so this lovely gentleman, does anyone know who this guy is? His name's on the bottom. So. Uh, this is Sir Isaac Newton, right? He was a physicist. Um, and he said, you know what? Gravity is a force. Gravity is this thing that if something has mass, it's gonna pull on other things. The heavier the thing is, the more mass it, or the more force that you feel, right? Also, that happens instantaneously, like right away. If you have mass, it automatically pulls on everything around it. And everything pulls on everything else all of the time, right? It takes zero time. Also, space that this is happening in is this, you know, very kind of linear, um, flat thing that we exist in, right? It's three-dimensional, but it's very flat. That's a really cool model and it worked for several hundred years. And then this guy came, his name is Albert Einstein, and he was like, wait, 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 wait. I think you might be missing something here. Uh, I don't think that things happen instantaneously. This does not exist, right? He said, space isn't flat like you think it is, but rather it's, it's actually incorporated with time in something called space time. And so what's going on is that you can actually bend that space time. So if this was space the way um, Newton saw it, if I put something on it, it just stays flat and then something else over here and they pull on each other. But here, if I put something on this, I'll put it upside down for you all. If I put something here, it actually bends that space time. So now if something wants to travel across the surface of this space time, it has to bend, it has to curve around something else, right? And so this is what Einstein said, and he called it space-time in his theory of general relativity. Now, when he did this, he said, you know what? All of this takes time. There is no such thing as instantaneous. If something has, even if something has no mass, it has to travel at some speed. It has to take some time to get somewhere else. And so there's one speed that's the fastest speed in the universe. Does anyone know what it is? C. C, what is C? The speed of light, right? So there's this speed that is like the fastest thing that you can travel, right? The fastest speed at which anyone can travel. And so that, that was Einstein's theory. He turned out, we don't know if he was right or not, right? Because it, he was able to figure out certain things that we couldn't solve before using Newton's theories. 
But then there was this other thing. He said like, no, but there's like, there's gravitational waves, okay? Like waves are created when you wiggle this thing, when you move it. And we had no way of measuring that, so who knows if he was right, right? But what does that mean? If I'm talking about three-dimensional space, this is a mass walking around in three-dimensional space, and what you see the space is doing, it's compressing around the object with mass, and then it stretches back out, right? So it's doing this like stretching and compressing and stretching and compressing as the mass moves through it. So what does that mean for, let's say, a sliver of space, right? So if this is my space time, if a gravitational wave, if gravity is acting on this as it's moving past me, what does that look like if I wanted to make a wave? So if this is my space time, what this wave would be doing is actually squeezing space in one direction, stretching it in the other, and then it moves the other direction. So it stretches in one direction and squeezes in the other, right? So it does this over and over again as it passes through space. Now, what that looks like in your three dimensions is something like this, right? This is a, seriously my favorite gift that I've ever found on the entire internet. Um, and it's from the uh, European Space Agency. And so this is showing you like this stretching in one dimension, squeezing in the other, and then stretching and squeezing, right? So it alternates. And as it alternates, it travels in the other direction. And so you have this like beautiful, it looks like Shai Hulud from Dune, right? Um, but it's not, this is just a gravitational wave, okay? So now we have a gravitational wave, but how, ooh, <laughs> how do you actually make gravitational waves happen? Well, you need mass, right? If we wanna actually measure them, if we want, we're talking about the Earth. If we wanna squeeze and stretch the Earth, we need something that's so heavy that it's actually gonna cause some shift in our planet, right? So what are some of the biggest masses in our planet, in our uh, universe? What do you think? Black holes. black holes, okay. Well, I have the sun. Sun's not quite as heavy as a black hole, but you can see that it's kind of heavy, right? It's bending my space time. Then I have neutron stars, which are bigger than our sun. They have a mass that's around two to two and a half times our sun, but their size is only six miles in diameter, meaning like the size of San Francisco. You have stars that are the size of San Francisco that have a mass two times that of our sun. That's intense. So they bend, they bend uh, space time a lot, right? Then, of course, we have black holes, which everybody's all about, okay? So black holes are like, hey, neutron star, you collapsed. Uh, you didn't stop collapsing and you kept going. And so you became super duper duper massive, right? And so these guys, like the size of them, were actually uncertain, okay? We know how, how massive they are, right? So these are very massive. So then how can you measure a force? If I have a mass, how can I measure a force? What do I need? What was Isaac Newton's equation? F equals mass times Acceleration, I need motion to make a wave, yes? Okay, so how do I get that motion? Well, if you have two black holes fighting each other, right? They start spinning around each other and they're warping the space time, right? You see this warping, look at this stretching and compressing and stretching and compressing. And then they start spinning around each other quite quickly, okay? They get faster and faster the closer they get because they're so heavy, right? And then, bloop, they stop. And all of the wiggling around them stops, right? So this is an actual simulation using real physics equations, okay? And what it shows is these two black holes merging into each other, into one bigger black hole, right? The question is, is this real? or imaginary. So who thinks this is fiction, science fiction? <laughs> okay, you're in the right place, right? <laughs> All right, and so this is what it looks like in a two-dimensional view, like thinking about the amplitude of the gravitational wave that was just created. So you have these two black holes of different sizes and they're rotating around each other and you see that the wave exists, but as they get closer and faster, the wave gets bigger, right? And then it stops 
and it travels out radially in all directions. Do you know how fast it travels? It doesn't have any mass, so how fast do you think it can go? The speed of light, right? So Einstein thought of all of this, but we had no way to measure it, OK? And what he said is like, hey, if those waves travel the speed of light and come to the Earth, well, how's it going to affect the Earth? This is very exaggerated, <laughs> OK? Um, this is how the Earth has a little bit of boogie, right? So this is what it does. It does this little shimmy dance, right? And this is very exaggerated. This actually happens on such a tiny, tiny scale. The amount that the Earth shakes on is actually 1 10 thousandth of the width of a proton, <laughs> which is like, what does that even mean? It's basically 1 tenth of a billionth of a billionth of a meter. So it's super tiny. There's no way we can see this or feel this ever, right? But there are things that we can use that maybe can see it. Um, and Kathleen mentioned that I'm a, the laser chick. So if you came to a talk and didn't want to hear about lasers and I'm giving it, that's too bad, OK? So we're going to talk about lasers. Now, this right here is something that's called an interferometer. We have an exhibit you can play with in the museum. Um, it's towards the back in the, next to like the giant mirror and the colored shadows. It's really close to colored shadows. Um, and so we're going to play a game that I invented called Ride the Photon. All right? So if I have a laser and I turn it on, where are my photons going to go? Photons are particles of light, by the way. Waves are also part of light. OK? It's both. Secret. OK? If I turn on my laser, where is the light going to go? What's it going to interact with first? The splitter, right? Somebody said splitter. OK, let's see if you're right. Do, 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 do. Hits the splitter. Bam. Good job. OK, now it hits the splitter. Where's it going to go? What's going to happen? We have some down. Two directions. What? what? How do you know that? Oh, because it's called a splitter, huh? huh? It's because it splits the light. OK, this is called a beam splitter, and it splits the light. So half the light's going to go down, half the light's going to go through. OK? Then these are two mirrors. OK, so what's going to happen after it hits the mirrors? This one's easy. It's going to turn around. Boop, boop. Goes back to the splitter. Now what's going to happen? Detector. Oh, and back to the laser, right? So now it's going to go up and back to the laser. OK? This is called an interferometer because we're making light interfere with itself. We take the light, we split it into two, and then we recombine it. And when we get to the detector, you have two laser beams. And where the laser beams overlap, you see a really interesting phenomena called an interference pattern. OK? Now here is how we actually measure gravitational waves. So this is flipped upside down. But basically, here's the laser. Here's your beam splitter. You have one mirror second mirror, and then here's your detector, right? Now, as I mentioned, light's a wave. So waves have peaks and waves have crests, yeah? So if I have a peak of, a, of one wave from one arm matching up with the peak of another arm, I'm going to see a signal. I'm going to see the whole beam of light, right? They're going to recombine, and they're going to make a light wave. If I have a peak of light and a crest of light, they're going to cancel each other out, and then there's no light. I don't know if you knew this, but light can cancel itself out, which to me is one of the most fantastic parts of physics. OK? So what it looks like is when, there's, when they're perfectly aligned and the light travels the exact same distance in both of these arms, you don't see anything. There's no light at all. And then when a giant gravitational wave comes and starts jiggling these mirrors, right? what it does is it moves one mirror in and the other out and then the opposite, right? So it does this really cool thing. And as it does that, the light starts appearing on the detector, right? And so you see this interference pattern, and this is the interferometer. Now, I mentioned that this is a giant, giant, massive thing happening, and yet it's moving us tiny, tiny amounts. So in order to see anything, we need these laser arms to travel for a really, really, really long distance. That distance should be about four kilometers, right? Just two and a half miles. That's hella far. I don't even know how far two and a half miles is. It's really far, right? And so if you think about this, the Earth actually curves at a rate lower than this. 
So when they were building these interferometers, this is what they look like. I'm talking about giant lasers. This is the laser, this is the arm, and that's the mirror. This is the arm and that's the mirror, right? We have two of them in our country, in the United States. So it's called LIGO, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, because this is an observatory that we're using to measure gravitational waves. We're measuring giant masses crashing into each other from space. Like, holy crap, right? So we have one in Livingston, Louisiana, and then we have one in Hanford, Washington, okay? This one's in a forest, that one's in a desert. We wanted it far away from cities, rock concerts, anything that will shake up our mirrors, right? We want it to be pretty flat. Problem is, this is really far and the Earth starts curving. So for those of you flat earthers out there, <laughs> sorry to disappoint you, but uh, when they were building this, right, they're building it and so the mirror is down here because it's on Earth, but the light is going straight, so it's over here. And they were like, yo, <laughs> we have to actually raise our mirrors by a meter. Like that's how much the Earth curves, is that it goes down by almost an entire meter over that length of four kilometers, okay? So this is super cool. These are giant lasers, right? So now, what do we use them for? Well, we put mirrors in them. These mirrors are also giant, right? And they have to be very sensitive. So this looks crazy. It's not just a standard mirror. And it's because it has this multiple pendulums. So it's hanging uh, off of like four different mirrors. There are four different masses above the mirror. And the purpose of that is actually to stabilize the mirror. So if the earth does shake because of an earthquake or something like that, then the mirror at the bottom isn't really gonna move very much. The heavy, mirror, the heavy masses at the top of the pendulum are gonna move and the bottom one's just gonna be like, yeah, I didn't notice that at all. And the cool thing about it is the string that's holding this mirror up, you can't see it because it's only about 0.7 millimeters thick. It's about the, the width of your fingernail. So it's like dental floss, right? Like even thinner than dental floss, hanging uh, uh, this giant mirror, okay? Say what? Glass, yep. Um, so it's actually very, very thin glass, similar to the glass that uh, is used for fiber optics, okay? These mirrors are also extremely flat. These are the flattest mirrors in, on the planet. Um, and that's because they want all of the lights to be able to reflect, right? If it's not perfectly flat, the light's gonna go in all kinds of different directions, okay? And it's in a vacuum tube, right? So it's a giant vacuum. We suck out all of the air so that nothing can get in the way of this laser beam. It's just the laser beam and it can travel at the fastest speed that it can possibly travel in so that we can really measure with high precision when these mirrors jiggle, okay? Now that's cool and all. And I'm saying that this exists and I'm asking you to just believe me. But then there's like these fictional things, right? Like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I don't know if you know what movie this is from. It's one of my favorite movies, right? Okay. This is Star Wars. Okay. What did you say? <laughs> okay. So we talk about, we say a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And when we see this, we automatically just think, oh, yeah, you know, Star Wars. No big deal. But if you really think about it, what does that mean? Right? If Einstein says that space and time are connected, that means that space and time are together. So if something was a long time ago, it had to be far, far away, right? Because light takes time to travel places. So if we see something that happened far, far away from us, it actually takes a long time for that to get to us, that information on the light wave. So I have this right here. Hopefully you all know what this is. I don't know. Kind of looks like licorice from here, but what do you think it is? It's a pipe cleaner, right? Do you know how long this pipe cleaner is? It's a foot, right? I actually chopped off a tiny bit of it uh, because I wanted to make it exactly 11.8 inches, which is 30 centimeters, which is the length that it takes for a photon of light to travel a nanosecond. So in one nanosecond, light goes from here to here. That's how long it takes to travel, okay? So now if I'm gonna talk about really, really far distances, right? Am I gonna give it to you in feet? 
or miles or meters, kilometers, when I can give it to you in speed of light. I can say, hey, if something is a gajillion miles away, what does that actually mean to you, right? But if I say something is a billion light years away, you know that's hella far, right? If something is a billion light years away, it means that it took one billion years for light to get from there to here, right? If you think about the moon, when we look at the moon, the light from the moon takes 1.3 seconds to get to us. We look at the sun, the light takes eight minutes to get to us from the sun, right? And the sun is 94 mi million miles away, right? Or I can say it's eight light minutes, because that's easier. So now, moving forward in this talk, I'm gonna go from science fiction to actually talking about the factual length that light has to travel to get to us. And I'm gonna mention it all in light years, okay? So, this right here is your proof that Einstein was a genius, all right? This was our very first gravitational wave detection. We actually saw two black holes circling around each other and then crashing into each other to make a bigger black hole and it released this giant gravitational wave and it wiggled our mirrors and we freaking saw it, okay? So what you're seeing here, there's a lot of information on this slide and you also see it on my shirt, okay? So here on the top, this is the data from Washington, okay? You see the squiggly data and then you see the smooth data, right? The squiggly data is actual data. This is like the measurements of the mirrors moving. And then the smooth one is using Einstein's equations simulating, oh, if I had a black hole of this size and a black hole of this size and they were this far away from us, this is what it would look like if they crashed into each other. And what do you know? That matches pretty well, I would say, okay? Then you saw in Livingston over here, exactly 0.7 seconds later, can you imagine why it takes 0.7 seconds? Like there's a difference in their data? Yeah, 0.7 seconds, yeah, right? So 0.7 light seconds, okay? It takes to get from Livingston to Hanford, it's about 3,000 miles, okay? And they saw the exact same signal. And so what you see down here are the two signals overlapped when they shifted it by 0.7 seconds. 0.7 seconds, <laughs> okay? So now what I'm gonna play for you is a really cool video. This video shows this signal. Now again, what the signal is, you have two black holes, they're rotating around each other. So as they rotate, they're creating this gravitational wave. It's low frequency, right? It's just kind of like wobble, wobble, wobble. Then they get closer together and they're very massive. So they start spinning even faster. So the frequency picks up. Then they crash into each other. So the frequency goes super duper fast and then it stops, okay? This is what we're gonna see in this video. Now scientists were like, you know what? This is a frequency. This is just straight up frequency. What other frequencies can we think about in our real life? Well, sound. We listen to frequencies, right? So why don't we take this signal and up convert it, right? Like turn it into something we can hear. Can we hear gravitational waves smashing into each other? So what you're gonna hear right now, first you're gonna hear the actual sound of what the real frequency is, and then you're gonna hear it up converted to a register that we can hear with our ears, okay? So, here it is. You're nothing. Do you hear that? Right, so that little boop, that is this chirp. The whole bloop is going from low frequency to high frequency, right? That's called a chirp. So it's like, whoop, that whole thing is the whole process, okay? And the whole thing takes, you know, like millions of years, <laughs> okay? Also, I should mention, how far away do you think this was? We have no idea, right? <laughs> this was 1.3 billion light years away from us, which means it was, in fact, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Our galaxy, is not 1.3 billion light years big. It's only 1.9 million light years long, okay? So this came from a galaxy really far away. 
And these are, in fact, two black holes rotating around each other and smashing into each other. That's so cool, you guys. Like, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, I know exactly where I was when I heard about this because I lost my whole mind. And the coolest thing about this is they built these giant lasers back in 1998, right? And we didn't have all the technology to make it super good, so it didn't work. Uh, and then they made upgrades, it still didn't work. And then they were like, you know what? We're gonna make the vacuum system. We're gonna have way better mirrors. We're gonna have way better isolation. All the things that I showed you. And in 2015, September 14th, 2015, right? So they turned this thing on in September. And a couple days later, they saw this, okay? It worked. Now, I don't know how many of you are actual scientists, even if you're not a scientist. If you work on your car, if you're cooking a meal, Whatever you want to do, and it says it takes 30 minutes, it actually takes two hours, right? So this right here, for them to turn on this instrument, and then it just worked right away, and we saw something real, is very intense, OK? Now, of course, you can imagine that it's, a, it's quite a big deal. I like to highlight amazing uh, scientists and technicians. This guy right here, Corey Gray, he's the lead operator at LIGO in Washington. He's a Blackfoot Indian. And he's amazing. He was actually the lead operator on the day that this signal came in. He wasn't sitting at the chair. He likes to talk about this. But he was still the lead operator, right? Um, he and his mother, Sharon Yellowfly, it's mostly his mother, but he gives his mother all of the um, transcripts of like the press releases for LIGO because they're like, we want, this is a huge deal. We want to tell the whole world. And he said, well, you can tell the whole world, but I want to tell my community, right? I want to tell the Blackfoot people of Siksika Nation. So his mother takes Siksika language, which is a spoken language. It doesn't have like a written dictionary. She created one for this. She invented the words gravitational wave in Siksika language. She translates it. It's pure poetry. It's beautiful. So now every press release that LIGO puts out is available in Siksika. Okay. He's also cool because he has this really nerdy tattoo on his arm. Uh, so, you know, because this was such a big deal, and this happened in 2015. Um, so Einstein published his uh, theory of general relativity in 2016, or sorry, 1916, uh, right? So it's almost 100 years, right? So Einstein's birthday, does anyone know when Einstein's birthday is? March 14th, Pi Day, okay? So this cool guy, Corey Gray, on March 14th, 2016, exactly 100 years from when Einstein published his theory, he was like, you know what? I'm getting this tattoo. And he did. OK, and so now he has this on his body forever. And it's super dope because all the pictures he takes, like with all the Nobel Prize winners, like he just pulls out his arm. He's like, yeah, look at this, right? Like he would stand next to me with my t-shirt, and he'll just put his arm right here and be like, mine's better, <laughs> you know? Um, and so this is a huge scientific collaboration. So now we have other uh, giant lasers in other parts of the world. So there's this one in Germany. This one's a little baby. This one's only 600 meters. And so because of this length is not very long, right, we can't, it can't measure that far back in time, right? We measured 1.3 billion light years. This can't measure that far. Virgo, however, can. So this is Virgo in Italy. This one's three kilometers, so it's not far from what we have. Um, and so this, this guy's in Italy, in the middle of farmland, right? And so using all of these, they were like, how far can we go? It was such a big deal um, when we brought these two extra ver uh, interferometers online that we were able to see a whole bunch of collisions, right? So here you see, like, these are the simulations, of course, of these are real signals. Well, these are the models of them, but they match the real signals, OK? And these are the dates. So it's like 2017, you have um, July, August, 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 August. We were seeing hella signals, OK? And so they were like, how do we make this even better? But also, how do we tell the world? Well, you give them a Nobel Prize. That's how you tell the world, right? So they actually won the Nobel Prize in physics in 2017. Um, these three men, Rainer Weiss, who actually had the idea like 50 years ago, yo, we should build giant lasers to like prove Einstein's theory. And so he gets half the prize, right? Half of it's his. Uh, and then these two guys are theoreticians, and they actually got everything to match up with the theory, 
right? You may have heard of either both uh, or either of them, um, but some people I know have, they know Kip Thorne because you may have seen the movie Interstellar. That's, that's all about his work, right? He straight up said, yo, Hollywood, I wrote this really cool book um, about gravitational waves and like space and black holes and you should make a movie about it. And they were like, okay, let's do that. And then, you know, they cast Matthew McConaughey. Um, it's a pretty good movie, even though there's some things that I have that I don't love about it. Anyway, a week before this happened, something even cooler happened, okay? Something even cooler that should have won the Nobel Prize, but they already won it, so they're not gonna get it again. But a week before this happened, this happened. They get this signal. Now, uh, I wanna warn you, your seats may shake a little bit. Again, this is gonna be upconverted into sounds that we can hear, okay? So now, most of our signals that we saw before, they're pretty short. They're like one to two seconds, you know? And then they see this signal. And they're like, this is, this is going on for a while. Like, what's happening right now? And it keeps going. And it keeps going. And it keeps going. And they're just like, I, I don't understand what's happening, right? It even shakes the air conditioner. That's a gravitational wave. No, I'm just kidding. That's a sound wave. And it keeps going. It just keeps going. <laughs> okay, so that is a very long signal just like this. But why do you think it took so long? And they were wondering the same thing. Yes. Mm, it was really big so they can detect them more easily. Any other ideas? Aliens. Ooh, it could have been aliens talking to us, right? Okay. So you're very close. They were closer to Earth. Okay. So that's one thing. They're closer to Earth. Another is they weren't actually bigger, but they were smaller. So because they were smaller, they're rotating more slowly. So their frequency is lower and it takes them a longer time to pick up the speed, right? To pull on each other. Their gravitational pull is less. So it took this super long time. So what we realized is we just measured neutron stars collapsing. They're merging. Two stars. You guys don't understand what I just said. Let me say it again. Two neutron stars straight up rotated around each other and crashed into each other. What does that even mean, right? You have two stars. They're rotating around each other, warping space time all around them. And then this is the best part in the whole planet. They hit each other, collapse, and bam! Not only do they emit gravitational waves, they emit light. They emit matter, right? This is a huge deal. We've been able to measure neutron stars using telescopes, right? In fact, when this happened, there was a telescope in space, a satellite telescope that we have called the Fermi Satellite Detector. It saw this out in space. And it was like, yo, there's like a neutron, there's something happening over here. We're measuring it in, in uh, uh, gamma rays. So then they called up LIGO and LIGO's like, oh, we saw something too. Maybe it's the same thing. So then they called everybody on the planet who had a telescope. They're like, yo, do you have a telescope? What are you doing today? Uh, it doesn't matter. You need to point your telescope over here, okay? Because we saw this on all three detectors. So all three giant laser systems and this satellite saw this. And what does this mean? This means that all of these different ways of measuring this, we invented a new type of astronomy. This is now called multi-messenger astronomy. We don't just measure gravitational waves, but now we can measure this in light. We can measure it in gamma rays. We can measure it in ultraviolet light. We can measure it in x-rays. We can measure it in visible light. We can measure it in infrared. We can measure it in microwave and we can measure it in radio waves. We have all of that information about this collision. So we know everything there is to know about this, except what happened after they crashed into each other. <laughs> we don't know. Um, you know, it, does it form a black hole? Does it form a bigger neutron star? That's iffy because the size of it is questionable. And I'll explain that in a second, right? So this is great. And this is the best part about it. This is the periodic table of elements. You may have seen it before, I don't know. 
And what you see here is like, it's telling you how these things came to be. So we all know like hydrogen and helium mostly came from the Big Bang, right? And then there's different kinds of like fission or like exploding stars might put some things out. But then you get to this point where we have no idea how these heavy elements came to be. How did the gold on your wrist, where did it come from? Where did platinum come from? It straight up came from neutron stars crashing into each other, okay? So when people say like, oh, thank, your, thank the stars, literally thank the stars, okay? If you buy your bow or whatever, an engagement ring, it's because stars crashed into each other billions of years ago and left some metal on our planet, okay? So this is super amazing. It, it literally changed physics and chemistry, right? So then it's like, where can we even go from there? <laughs> like, I don't even know, this is amazing. This is all of the measurements that LIGO has made so far, okay? And it's not just LIGO, this is also electromagnetic measurements, so using telescopes. So using telescopes, we've seen neutron stars all in yellow over here. This is how many neutron stars we've measured, okay? And you see, like this is solar mass, so you know, our sun is at one, and neutron stars are generally somewhere between one to two and a half the mass of our sun, so they're, you know, Massive, but not that massive. And they're all down here. Then you have black holes, which are all of these. Black holes are generally five times the mass of our sun or bigger, okay? And so all these purple ones are black holes that we've measured using different kinds of telescopes, using electromagnetic radiation, using X-rays or gamma rays, okay? Then in blue here, you see what LIGO and Virgo have measured, this collaboration, all these lasers, right? And what you see is, marriage happening, basically. You see these two, one mass of, what, 19 and one mass of 21, got together and made a mass of 40, okay? So that's what all these little jellyfish looking things are, okay? It's showing you all of the mergers that we've measured. And so you might be wondering, okay, cool, but like, what is this? What do you think this is? Basically. Neutron, Neutron stars merging with black holes. Say what? Okay, so we saw two stars crashing into each other. We saw two black holes crashing into each other. But have we ever seen a black hole straight up eating a star? The answer is yes. Yes, we have. This just happened last January. Okay, this is a simulation, obviously. Um, but what you're seeing is the black hole and the neutron star are circling each other. And they're really disturbing space time all around them. And it's like devouring the star, right? It starts eating up all of its mass and, and light. And then it just, just straight up ate it. And then you see the wiggle and it sent our signal. The cool thing is that we saw two of them in 10 days. So one of them happened January 5th, uh, 2020. And one of them happened January 10th, or sorry, January 15th, 2020, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's radially in all directions. Yeah. So it's not in just one plane. It's everywhere. Yeah. But we can only, you know, look at it like this. Okay. So that's what's going on now. Okay. That's what happened most recently. They shut it down in March because of COVID. So all of the laser systems are down right now and they're doing lots of repairs, uh, doing all kinds of things. And they started this guy. So we built another one. This one's in Japan, okay? It's called the Kagra and it's underground. It's like inside of a mountain, which is super dope, okay? This guy is actually uh, cryogenically cooled. So the mirrors are even more sensitive. Now the arms are only three kilometers. So again, they can't see back super far, but they will help us see a lot of the black holes or sorry, a lot of the neutron stars, which happen a little bit closer, right? Um, and so now we've got one, two, three, four, five laser systems that are gonna be up and running in 2020. They're gonna announce next week when they're gonna start their new observational run. Um, and we're also building one in, in India right now. And this one is hopefully going to be ready by 2020 to join in with the other ones, okay? So the next thing, you're not gonna believe this. This is totally science fiction. Space lasers! We're gonna build an interferometer that goes in space, okay? 
the arms are going to be a hundred, or sorry, one gigameter, which is like a million kilometers, okay, in length, um, which is a lot, by the way. <laughs> it's way bigger than the Earth. It's like a hundred times bigger than the Earth, right? Even more, a thousand times bigger than the diameter of the Earth. There's the Earth over there, okay? We're going to build one, two, three satellites with lasers on them. And they're going to be shot at each other. And using this, with this huge arms, we're going to be able to measure way far back in time and space. Do you think that's real? <laughs> yeah, it totally is. OK? This is actually real. It seems like it's science fiction, but I promise it's not. They are working on this right now. They actually are accepting grants. If you have ideas on how to study this science and improve this, give them a call. You know. Um, so that's all. Thank you so much uh, for your attention and interaction. Um, I appreciate you.